All right, let's put our hands together and give God a great big praise. I pray He's worthy of the praise. He's worthy of the glory. He's worthy of the honor. He's a good God. Let us thank those who are even tuning in of the video. Uh, this is lesson two, where we're going to go over content. Once again, this is Messiah's Temple. We're the pastors of the Honorable Bishop Harry Grayson. And we are thankful to be here today. We're thankful to be alive. We go to not, nothing but the mercy of God that we have not been consumed. And therefore, we give God praise. How many enjoyed the class last week? Amen. Oh, hallelujah. He's a good God. He really is a good God. And this is an important lesson because we are learning about how to read the Bible. The Bible says, in all thy getting, he says what? Get an, get an understanding. So we don't want to just act out ignorantly, but we want to do so with as much knowledge as we can get. All right? Amen. And so I'm going to go over just a brief recap. Just for those who missed lesson one, we're not going to go into any detail. Just some things I think that you should know it. And if you do have your PowerPoints from last week, the handout, it has a lesson with us that you can follow along, just in case you didn't get all the meanings, there are definitions in there and whatnot. As well as every table, there is a new handout for week two. So if you need a handout, there's some of the great photos. Sister Angie has her hand up, my lovely wife. Please let her know if you need a handout for lesson two. So we're gonna go ahead and get started because there's a lot to cover today. and I'm excited to share this. So once again, it is a privilege to be uh, sitting next to, I call her Dr. Chris, Mama Chris, yeah. uh, because she has a wealth of knowledge and understanding, uh, not just because she's who she is, but she has put the time in at school, and she's well qualified and well learned, as well as so many of the individuals in this audience. Um, I don't take it for granted to even be up here. In fact, I should probably sit with you guys because I'm learning as we go, all right? We're going to learn together. Is that an amen? Amen. All right, so we learned in uh, lesson one, um, valid interpretation of the Bible has several distinct purposes and benefits. Um, the first thing we learned was to, to discern God's message, to avoid or dispel misconception or erroneous um, perceptions and conclusions about the Bible. It teaches us how to apply God's message to our lives. We learn that the Bible is made up of scriptures that are inspired by the Holy Spirit. Um, we also learn here, there are qualifications for interpreting the scriptures. And there's some things that we wanted to make sure that we're practicing and taking in. And once again, I'm reading this directly off the PowerPoint for lesson one. Um, reason faith in God who reveals. So we need to have faith in God. We need to have two, willingness to obey uh, the message that's in the word of God. Number three, the willingness to employ appropriate methods. That means we want to learn as we go. We want to continually learn and to apply different methods as we grow in Christ. Um, number four, which is so important, though we're reading the word of God, remember the word of God is a living spirit. Therefore, we need the spirit of God to guide us and direct us. The Bible says that the Holy Ghost will lead us and guide us into what? All truths. So we need the Holy Spirit um, to deal with the Word of God. Uh, and number five, we need membership in a church. You can sit at home and read your Bible all day long, but you need to come to the house of God to where the pastor is, where the ministers and elders, where the deacons and the sisters and brothers are at that can expound on the Word of God and bring illumination and a revelation to the Word of God. Amen? Amen. So that's just a brief uh, summary of lesson one. We're going to jump into lesson two um, right away. And uh, we're going to deal today uh, with content. Everybody say content. content. So we're hoping to cover these things briefly. The difference in translations, the problems with translations of the Bible, um, the original languages that the Bible was written in. Uh, we want to learn how to choose the proper translation for interpretation. Um, in topic two, we're going to go over some of the tools um, that you can use to study the Word of God and to bring some application and bring some richness to yourself um, so that you can get all that God has for you to get. Amen? Amen. So, uh, I want to start off with this, this clause, this statement real quick because uh, it's important. Uh, if you're going to be a student of the Word of God, uh, you're going to start somewhere. Uh, and that place a lot of us start at is the King James Version. In my house growing up, that was the only version that we had. Mm -hmm. 
We didn't have the Amplified Version. Uh, we didn't have the NIV Version. My mom said, if you want to read that Bible, you better get that Bible out and read that Bible in King James Version. Can you imagine me as an eight-year-old boy trying to say, thus is the thou's and these and whatnots? Because it was in old English. Old English, a dead language that the King James Version Bible is based in. And though it is probably the first Bible that we pick up, and when I'm saying Bible, we're referring to translation right now, it's important to understand that the language that that is written in is old, it's antiquated, it's outdated. So there are, and we're going to experience some things tonight, um, some things that we can do to help um, bring out more life in the King James Version um, that we are reading. So we find here uh, that, and this is a fact here, um, the issue with the King James Version is that the King James Version Bible was translated uh, from 1,611 manus different manuscripts. So they found these manuscripts, King James them and his peoples, and they began to translate the Bible from the original language, which the Old Testament was in Hebrew and Arabic, and you had the New Testament that was in primarily Greek. And he began to translate the Word of God. And so, as you begin to translate the Word of God, you're going from the original language, and you're putting it into English. And then once he had that Bible together, we had um, the King James Version. In your handout, if you would go to the back of the page, Jimmy Johns is here, Jimmy Johns is here in the back, amen. So if, if you go to the back of the page, you're going to find a chart or an overview of many different versions of the Bible and the different dates and times that those Bibles were translated. So this is a visual thing that you can look at and you can see where they came at, where they started at, what year. Uh, did they come into existence? And as they came into existence, we were not, they came into existence based on the different manuscripts and the different methods that were used to transcribe those um, different manuscripts. So, why, Brother Harris, are you saying, is there a need to translate? Why, why are you making this such a big deal about the translation of the Bible in the King James Version? Well, let's start here. Um, just because um, the King James Version may have translated something that was originally in Hebrew or Greek to English does not mean that it captured the true essence or the true meaning of that word, right? Mm -hmm. So let's use a, a, an easy example. We're going to look at the word love. We know that I can say, hey, I love my wife, right? Then I can turn around and say, I love tacos. Then I can turn around and say, I love LeBron James. So the hearer, which would be you, would have to translate what is it that I'm saying about love about those two individuals or those three different things I named, my wife, tacos, and LeBron James. Now, using that example, you're going to find here that love actually means three different things here. You follow me? Now, in the Hebrew and in the Greek, they have particular words for love that would mean something different. And so when I say I love my wife, I'm talking about more so a romantic type of love, right? Mm -hmm. So in the Greek, that word's going to be eros, right? That has a romantic, that has a physical type of love associated with me loving my wife, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you hear me say I love LeBron James, and you're thinking eros, see what I'm saying? That brother said, oh, yeah, he's a little funny acting. And if I say, I love tacos in that manner, something wrong with that as well. That's crazy. So there are different meanings of the same word in English that it was transcribed from in its original text that we have to be aware of to get the exact meaning of that word. So watch this in John 3, 16, the Bible says, for so God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. What kind of love is he talking about right there? The love 
according to the scripture, we can associate in English any type of love. But the love in the scripture is actually talking about an agape type of love. It's talking about it in over encompassing great big love that's beyond that of a sexual love. It's a deeper type of love. Agape is unconditional love. So that's the love that this referring to in John 3.16. But once again, if you don't have any background knowledge of that, you can interpret that love to mean anything. Does that make sense, everybody? And so, so that's where we have, um, we go into the different types of, of translations that we have to be aware of and how we read the Bible. So I, I want to go here and I want to start talking about um, uh, these, tra these translations. Real quick. And we're going to deal with um, what is a good translation. There are 66 books of the Bible originally written, once again, in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and um, Greek. And so we find here that the scriptures in the King James Version is pulling from these contexts, and then the scribes or those who are transcribing the text have to then translate that text, those words, and the meaning into our English to try for us to be able to comprehend what's being stated. Um, so. There are two, there's some methods that were used that help them get through this process. There's some methods. It's called the science of translation. The science of translation. So, even in your handout here, if you go to the second page, You're going to find here, there's some terms here um, that you're going to see. We're going to see the word textual choice and linguistic choice, right? Mm -hmm. So, these are different methods that they use to get the scripture translated and rules they use to translate it to English. The textual aspect says this. This has to do with the actual wording of the original text. So anybody who has taken any foreign language in school, uh, in English, the word hello in Spanish is translated, um, can anybody help me? Hola. Hola. So that's literally taking a word for word basis and translating it over to the new language that's being done. Now. Uh, linguistic has to do with the rules of, of the language that we're using. And anybody who's studied English and then studied a foreign language and then had somebody who was foreign study English will tell you this. English is one of the most confusing languages to actually learn. Because the rules that English follows don't make sense. Even in our vowels and how we say different words. Like for instance, it took me a long time to understand that PH made a F sound. You put those two letters together, it makes an F sound. I don't understand it to this day. I'm glad we got the autocorrect spell on the text messaging and on the word. I miss words up all the time because the English language itself is complicated. So you have people trying to learn the English language. For them, it's like, oh, it's irritating. So, you're, you're dealing with these different challenges when you're talking about translating the original text over to the English text. Do I take the word-for-word -word meaning or the word-for-word -word and try to put it in there to get the English interpretation? Or there's another theory that they teach, and that theory is going to be based on uh, idea of the word. The idea of the word. So, linguistic says, we're going to translate, we're going to argue between words or idea. Words or idea. We're going to use some examples to bring that out a little further. Once again, there's another thing that has to take place. Words change their meanings over time, even in our language. One word that has changed its meaning and continues to evolve is the word gay. Now, gay means happy. Mm -hmm. But now, if you were to use the word that I'm gay, it means of your sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. So that's a word right there 
that we can use. It's not a slang word. It's not a word that you have to find on the street. It's a word you can find in your dictionary that has changed the meaning. So if I were to use that word now, that meaning is going to be a different meaning. So we have to take, uh, 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 take that into mind. That's called the historical, the, the historical distance of language, the differences that happen over time. Uh, so as we go further along, the question that we're going to ask ourselves when it comes to reading the Word of God what are you looking for in your translation? You kind of got to know where you're at and how your mind operates on how to choose a translation that's going to work out best for you. I want to say this. There is no such thing as this is the best translation for you to read and this is the wrong translation for you to read. Me and my wife are both preachers and we both have our own study habits, but me and my wife do not use the same translations of the Bible. I do not like reading language that I cannot understand. My wife will sit there and read King James Version for hours. I can sit there and maybe read it for five minutes. That's just because of the way my mind operates. And let's believe that Satan knows how to discourage the Bible reader. He knows how to sit there next to you and say, do you understand what you're reading? Did you say that word right? You would have sounded out. That didn't sound good. And there you are discouraged in your spirit and your mind that you could not read and understand the word of God. And your mind is going to tell you, you know what, turn on that TV, get on YouTube, find something that you can understand and entertain yourself with because this is a waste of time. Yeah. I want to stop right there and, and interject something real quick. It's funny how the word of God works. There are some scriptures that I read as a younger man. I'm still quite young, but there's some scriptures that I read that at that point in time that I did not understand. But over time and experience, the Holy Ghost has a way of illuminating the scriptures that you read and bringing the meaning and the revelation to you at the time that you need it. So that's why it's important that even when you're discouraged in your reading, don't stop reading. Everybody say, don't stop reading. Don't stop reading. Don't stop reading. So it's important that we continue to read because once again, I stated this. The Holy Word of God is not just a literature. It's not just a piece of literature. It's not just a novel. It's actually the Word of God. It is God himself in paper form. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God. The Word was with God. And that same Word became flesh. John said that same Word dwelt among us. So the Word of God is essential to every believer, even when it doesn't make sense to you. There's been times where the word of God does not make sense to me, but I know I still must take it in and then graft it in because the Holy Spirit is going to use that word somewhere, somehow, to benefit my life. I hear amen? Amen. And so, as we continue to read, I found out here there are more uh, translations than the King James Version. And so, because now we know there are versions that basically will translate the word of God based on word for word, like hello and hola, or translate the word of God based on the meaning of what they believe that writer is actually intending to say. So, uh, let's go a little bit further. Um, we're going to deal uh, with an example of why you have to be careful um, on how you are choosing your Bible. So on this page, right, on the second page on the back page, there's an example here that I've written down for you. And it's in 1 Samuel um, chapter 8, verse 16. I wrote this scripture down as an example of the textual differences and choices that different versions make. 1 Samuel chapter 8, 16 says, and this is the King James Version, and I'm not cussing, it's just what the King James Version says. It says, your goodliest young men and your asses. Right? That's a phrase right there. The NIV Version says this, the best of your cattle and donkeys. Now, that's a totally different statement right there. It's a lot easier to understand that last statement, NIV version, than it is to understand the King James version. 
No, I'm not telling you to throw away your King James Version. I'm not telling you to stop reading it. What I am suggesting, though, is that you have a companion translation to read alongside of it, to contrast and to compare, to see what different writers or how they are translating that scripture and seeing what's going to pop in your spirit and what the Holy Ghost is going to illuminate in your spirit. Now, there's a reason why that there's such a variance in the translation. Now, I'm not going to even try to say this Hebrew word, but I'm going to spell it out for you. It's B, I heard my laughing over there. You know I can't say this word. Can anybody say this word? Anybody? Say it again. But listen, I knew somebody would do it. It wasn't me, though. And, and so the first word, B H R Y K M, in Hebrew means your young men. Right? But if you go right below and read the next word, can you say that again? B Q R Y K M. The only change in this word, my wife's laughing at me. The only change in this word is the letter H and the letter Q. So if you imagine, remember what I said, these individuals were translating these documents by hand. It's easy to make an H and Q. I mean, for me, if you see my handwriting, I don't know what, I, I can't even read my own handwriting. If I don't type it out, I'm in trouble. Because it's easy for me to describe a simple letter. And see how that changes the word meaning right there? The King James Version and the NIV Version show subtle differences and variances and, and the textual choices that these translators made to translate the word of God. Is that making sense? So, we're going a little further. So, we, we talked about the linguistic choices. This concept deals with words and ideas. It puts a weight on, is the word more important or is the idea more important? Is the word more important and is the idea more important? Now, I'm going to use me and my wife as an example again because it's a good example. A lot of times when me and my wife are having an argument, now I lose with my wife all the time, I can't keep up. I try every day and it never works. I have not won yet one, one argument. And, and the reason why, I'm going to tell you why I lose the arguments. It's not because I'm wrong. I want to first put that out there. I, I, I know I'm not wrong. I can't get a witness in here. I see a few brothers in here. I don't hear no amens. No amen. I got some support. I, I, I know I'm not wrong. Uh, but, but, watch, but watch this. My, my wife is clever. She's clever because she has recall in a way that I can't recall things. And so, and, and so what she does, watch this, y'all. I'm I, I telling on myself here. Watch this. She'll say, now, what did you say? And she'll challenge me to repeat myself. Now, I will repeat myself because I'm the man of the house. But sometimes, I'm not exactly which word I use per se. <laughs> And my wife said, you didn't say that exactly. I'm like, no. Well, I know what I said. My meaning didn't change, but, but the choice of words did. And, and she got me. And I'm sitting there like, oh, God, what did I say? Jesus, bring me to my mind, Lord, help me. And, and, and so far, the Lord has been silent on that prayer. Uh, I'm not sure if he's holding back the answer because my, my living or not. But I, I'm going to figure that out somehow, some way. But the, the meaning, though, I promise you this, I never changed that meaning of what I was saying. Can I get a witness with him, the brothers? Amen. I'm now down to one brother saying, hey, man. We're talking about it. We're talking about it. Thank you, Jesus. I'm just praying my So, for me, the principle of the meaning carried more weight than the exact verbiage that I used. This is the concept that I'm trying to show you here that the different translations of the Bible have. Some translations are saying, you know what's more important to me is what I believe the author is trying to say versus what the author actually did say. Now, I want to throw a caveat in there real quick because 
it's important to know that some translations take out key verbiage, take out key words mm -hmm. that can totally transform a statement. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not against any version in particular, but there is a version in the NIV version that has taken out key scriptures and totally changed the meaning of certain concepts. Mm -hmm. So if you're not careful, and watch this, if you're relying on just one source of information, you may miss what was actually there in the text. So it's important that each of us use multiple translations. Remember, I'm not getting rid of King James. King James was there first. I'm adding to King James so that I can get a more well-rounded picture, so we can get a more clear understanding of what the Lord is saying to us. Let him that have an ear what? Let him hear, Let him hear what the Spirit is saying. So you want to make sure your ear is unclogged. One thing I'll say is, oh, baby, can you say it again? I have no problem having my wife repeat herself ten times with a straight face. Because it's important for me to understand exactly what she said. Now, if I'm that uh, uh, detail oriented when it comes to my life. How much more is it important for us to clearly hear what the Lord is saying to you? You know, it can be a matter of life and death when God speaks to you. It can be a matter of a blessing and a curse when the Lord is trying to speak to you. It not just for yourself, but for somebody who's relying on you. Last week I used the example that we find in the book of Acts about the man who was sitting there saying, I'm reading the book of Isaiah and I don't know what it's saying. How many times have we been in that situation ourselves or we know somebody we've been witnessing who's been reading and they don't know what it's saying. You want to be as well-rounded as possible to give the most clear answer to that believer who's needing that word from God. Is that serious? At some point in time, tradition has its place. I'm not saying get rid of the King James. I'm going to keep saying it until I'm blue in the face and I won't turn blue. So I'm keep saying, I'm not saying get rid of the King James Version. When I preach, I preach out of the King James Version. But when I study, I don't study out the King James Version. I'm telling on myself. I'm telling on myself. So it's important here. So let, let's, let's look at an example. Uh, in, in, in your handout, you keep reading down. Uh, let's look at an example of where it, they're going to look for the, the thought of the word versus the word itself. Uh, it's in 1 John uh, chapter 3 and uh, verse 17. And it says, and this is the King James Version, it says, Shutteth up his bowels. Shutteth up his bowels. Now, if I'm thinking about that, you know what my mind goes to? I'm still a young man, I'm still mature. I'm thinking about the bathroom. Shut up his bowels with no constipation. That's crazy. That's, that's tough. But I don't think that's what the meaning was right there. In that, in that little phrase, and I know that you, know, you want to read the rest of the scripture to get more context, but we'll just use this for example. The NIV version says, has no pity. That's a different meaning then shove his vows. Have no pity. That, that says something different to us to what that, that, um, that writer said. So let's, let's go ahead and read uh, 1 John 3, 17. I'm going to go ahead and go up my Bible. Um, real quick. Has everybody got that? Mm -hmm. 1 John 3 and, and 17. So whoso has this world's good and see if his brother's have need and shut it up his mouth of compassion from him, how dwell the love of God in him. Amen. 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 So that's what that was saying. So you could basically, you know, you could take the context of that scripture and figure, figure that out. But when you read that, read it again, instead of saying shut up his bow, says have no pity. Can you read that one more time? Instead of saying bow, say have no pity. But whoso hath this word good, good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his pity of compassion from him, 
I dwell with the love of God in him. So if you see your brother and sister in need, and you have no pity and no compassion, how can love God dwell in you? It's a lot clearer right there at that moment uh, to understand um, what that is saying. Amen? Amen. So I, I'm going to uh, I, I'm going to definitely transition a little bit, but I want to go over and show you a few more things before we, we go further uh, into tools. So there are some terms here uh, that I want to go over with you so that you can have a better understanding of where we're going with this. So when you're dealing with uh, these terms, uh, I want you to hear this out. So there's a term called formal equivalence. Formal equivalence is the attempt to keep as close to the form of the Hebrew or Greek or both words in grammar as can be conveniently put into understandable English. So that's basically talking about, like we said, hello, hola. Then there is functional equivalence. Functional equivalence states this. The attempt to keep the meaning of the Hebrew or the Greek, but to put their words or idioms into what would be a normal way of saying the same thing in English. So you say, what is idioms? That's, that's a good. So uh, I'm always using idioms around my wife because that's the way my family talk. And one of the idioms I use that my, my uh, wife always laughs about is that I say, it's something not right in that mouth. Uh, it's something not right in that mouth. When somebody says something crazy and it don't make sense, I'm like, that, that milk ain't white. And my wife said, that milk ain't white. You sound crazy. What, what are you talking about? <laughs> That's a saying here that if you were to translate that into English or uh, to Spanish and say that word, can anybody translate to Spanish that, that milk ain't white? Nobody here? <laughs> if I were to translate that into Spanish, and we're talking about uh, formal equivalence, though you may translate it word for word to Spanish, you still don't have any understanding of what that means when it says something ain't white in that milk. And you got it word for word. You, you got that right. But you lost the total meaning of that. Mm -hmm. So you're going to read that and you're going to say, Elvis said that milk okay, ain't white. <laughs> Y'all going to quote quoting that. Like, okay, white. And you're going to start believing that. When I never meant that. What I meant to say was something about what you just said or what I just seen or what just happened. It's, it's incorrect. It's, it's, that's, you're, you're telling a lie. That's what happens when you use only formal equivalents to translate, and the King James Version is basically formal, uh, 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 a formal equivalence of translating it word for word into our English. So can you imagine that in Hebrew, they have sayings too. They have different things that they were saying, different slang terms that they were saying, that if translated to English, we're going to lose the value of what they're saying. Amen? And so you have, once again, the functional equivalence. That's the attempt to keep the meaning of the Hebrew or the Greek, but to put their words or idioms into once again uh, our sayings, trying to basically uh, keep the best of both worlds. And that's considered to be uh, dynamic, a dynamic translation. And so you have another concept called free translation. Uh, the the concept of free translation is the attempt to translate the ideas from one language to another with less concern about using the exact words or the original words at all. A free translation, sometimes also called a uh, paraphrase, tries to eliminate as much of the historical distance as possible and still be faithful um, to the original text. So, once again, in your chart that I provided for you, you're going to notice that some versions here seem to be a little bit more left towards word-for-word -word translations, which is, would be the uh, formal equivalence. 
And then you see some translations look like they're leaning a bit more right towards the right side of the arrow, which is going towards more a free translation. And then you're going to see um, some that seem to be somewhat in the middle of the, um, the, 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 the scale, if you will. So your, your formal or your literal translations are like your King James Version um, of the Bible. Uh, you have your uh, New King James Version of the Bible. Um, and here's the, the actual version I read all the time. The ESV Version of the Bible. That's the English Standard Version. It's still technically classified as a word-for-word -word translation. The difference with the ESV version and the New King James Version and the King James Version is that the ESV version strives to get rid of the dead language, the old English words that we really don't use anymore and it replaces it with the words that we're using. So it's still pretty much a very close read um, to the King James Version. And so I use the ESV version um, all the time. If you are looking for, you say, Brother well, Harris, I'm looking for something more of that dynamic um, area, something of that dynamic way, that middle ground. You, know, you have the big one is the NIV version and the uh, New Living Translation version, the NLT version. Um, I use the New Living Translation version all the time. So I may read out the ESV version. The next version I'm going to go to is the, and once again, there is no right or wrong answer here. Everybody is different. Everybody studies differently. Um, I'm going to go to that, um, uh, that, that uh, New Living Translation version because I like that version of the Bible. And then, you, of course, you have some free versions uh, like the, the Message Bible. Everybody heard of the Message Bible? That got real popular. That, that version of the Bible is pretty much, if you ask me, it's, it's almost like commentary. Because it's, it's taking what the scripture is saying, but it's really putting it in somebody else's words. And, and, and I, I, want, I want to say this, I'm going to say this in another part of our lesson. It's important that when you're reading the Bible, ask God, what is it supposed to mean to me? What is it meaning to me? I, 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 I'm going to look at other people's meanings, but I need to know what it's meaning to me. Amen? So I'm quickly going to go over some tools. Is this all right for everybody? Okay, amen. And so I'm going to go over some tools real quick that, that you can use when it comes to translating your Bible, the verses that you're using. So I didn't bring the books, but these books can be bought via Amazon, um, and you can order these books, or if you have um, the, um, an Apple device or a Google device, you know, a lot of these books can be bought um, within the library, and I'm even going to show you one more method of buying these books that I use personally uh, to use these books um, in my everyday study. So the first thing I want to tell you about, and this is more so once again, probably common sense, but the coordinates. Uh, the coordinates is an alphabetical index of all the words in a text uh, uh, that shows you where that word is in that scripture. So if you're looking for words, so a lot of times I may not know the scripture per se, but I know a couple words that are in that, or a couple key words that are in that, that scripture. I'm going to go to my coordinates, and I'm going to look up that, that word, and that word is going to lead me to a scripture I can find. A lot of people actually don't realize you already have a concordance with you. In your um, study Bibles, in your King James Version Bibles, if you are to go to the back of your Bible, most Bibles have a small concordance in them already. So you may not have to go out and buy a, uh, a separate concordance. Open up your Bible, go to the back of the Bible, and, and look for a concordance, and look for that word you're looking for, and there you go. Uh, the second thing that I believe that every believer should have is a good Bible dictionary. Now, if you don't have a Bible dictionary, a dictionary will do because it will give you the meaning of the word. But what I, uh, what I like about a Bible dictionary is a Bible dictionary is going to give you a little bit more context when it comes to the scriptural meaning of the word as well and how it was applied. And so I wrote down an example here that we could all look at um, to figure out and we can do this together. On, on what this word means, okay? So the Bible dictionary be like this. 
we're going to read um, Ezra um, chapter 2 and verse 63, and I'm reading out the NIV version. And it says, uh, the governor ordered them not to eat any of the most sacred food until uh, there was a priest ministering with the, uh, can somebody help me that word? Urim. Urim and the. Thummim. Anybody know without looking down what that means? Uh, I know you know. <laughs> but that, that, that's a word, so you can raise the right word if you want to and keep going to the next verse, or you can stop and pause and say, let me get this Bible dictionary out and see what's the, the significance of, of that word. And if you go down, I took this definition out of the New Bible Dictionary. It says the urine and the film, and I probably said that wrong, were kept in the high priest's breastplate. And watch this. The, 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 it's going to give you even a verse where you can see where that's also at in the Bible. Give you more context clues. A pouch fastened to the ephod, and sometimes with it simply referred to the ephod. You said, well, where's, when, when was that ever an important um, statement? Well, you remember when David was at Ziglag? He did this. And, and the meaning is, watch this. It says, by the urine of the throne, the priest could declare God's will to both leader and to the people. And it gives you a couple other verses you can. But in the story where David was at the, uh, the, the Ziklag, we find here that he was overtaken. And the Bible says that his men were upset and they were frustrated. And David had to withdraw to himself. And he, and he had to seek the, um, the ephod. He put on the priestly garments and said, Lord, shall I overtake them in pursuit? So I think if I'm understanding this correctly, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, those stones would change a different color, am I right? To give up, to give that answer to David. So when he took that ephod, he prayed and asked the Lord for an answer. And God gave him an answer. He said, pursue and you shall overtake him over and recover all. And we all love the message of the preacher's preaching. You have received you will overcome. David got that from that piece of uh, priestly garments. That that new Bible dictionary, that Bible dictionary will give you some context and give you deeper meaning and revelation uh, for those words. So, uh, I'm going to talk about something that uh, they call it the preacher's handbook, but it's really called the Haley's Bible Handbook. And the Haley's Bible Handbook is a great little book for anyone who just wants some, some general knowledge, some background knowledge um, on what you're reading. Um, the Haley, and it's really easy to understand. So let's take a, a look at this. And I wrote something down in here that we could also use, for example, how Haley's handbook works. So in Titus chapter 1, verses 5 and verse 12, once again, this is the NIV version again. It says, the reason I left you in prayer was that you might straighten out what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Even one of their own prophets has said, Christians are always liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. Well, you can take it. It's pretty easy to understand what he's saying. But why is he saying what he's saying? So if you were going to take his handbook and go over to Titus, you would find out, and we'll read this to you. It says, the Hades handbook says this about this, this topic, this scripture. An island also known as Canida, southeast of Greece, on the border between the uh, Aegean and the Mediterranean seas, about 150 miles long, 7 to 30 miles wide. The people were kin to the Philistines. That gives us some context because we know about Philistines, right? Uh, thought to have been identical with the Sheratites, which we can find in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 14. And it gives us this statement. They were daring sailors and famous bowmen with a very bad moral reputation. So if you read that in Haley's handbook, it's going to give you some of that background context. Who, what, when, where, why. Who, what, when, where, why. Who, what, when, where, why. Mm -hmm. Haley's handbook will fill in some of that information for you so that you have a better understanding of what you just read. That's Haley's handbook. Now, we're going to deal with something that, and the reason why I have it last, and there's a warning with it, 
is because commentaries can be quite tricky things to deal with. Um, when um, I grew up in church all my life, and when I felt the call of God all my life, I was at a quite young age, and I went to my pastor and told him, I said, I think God is talking to me, and he's giving me things to write. And I said, what are some books I can read to enhance my knowledge of God? And I thought he was going to give me his favorite commentary to read. He said, no, son, keep reading his word. The reason why he said that, and now I understand why, is because what commentaries are is a series of explanations or, watch this, interpretations. So there's somebody interpreting those scriptures for you and giving you a predetermined meaning for those scriptures for you, an expository giving an enlightenment based on what they think that scripture means. Now, all commentaries are not bad commentaries. But the thing is, you don't want your base knowledge to be based on what a commentary says. Before you even get to the commentary, you want to have already exhausted going over your Bible dictionary. You don't want to exhaust it uh, looking at the root word. Um, there's another Bible that didn't go over, but it's literally a, a literal word for word uh, uh, Bible. And that's the, the uh, and see, what is that Bible? The, the keyword? No, liminary. Uh, oh, linear. The what? You said it was linear. The linear. The linear Bible. What the linear Bible does is that, and I use it in my phone versus actually an actual book. The linear Bible, and I do have the actual book, but it actually takes each word of that scripture and it's translated to what the Hebrew word was or the Greek word was. And it gives you a direct meaning of that word. Now that's some, you know, some more advanced stuff. But that is an exercise that if you really want to have true revelation, it's something you like to practice. Reading the word of God and studying the word of God is an art form. It's not something that I have grasped or understand or have a complete um, understanding on it. I called Dr. Chris, I talked to her about um, some of my hermeneutical spirals that I'm going through. I called Bishop up and I, and I asked him questions about different scriptures and, and different things and what the meaning is. But all of my questions cannot substitute actually getting in the Word of God myself and practicing how to read the Word of God. Amen. Um, there's one more thing um, that I want to show you real quick. Um, I'm going to plug in real quick. And I'm going to show you just those little tools that I showed you. Um, let's see um, that quote, the red, this red one. Now, anybody knows me, I am, I wouldn't say I'm a cheap person. My wife thinks I'm a little cheap. But I say I'm building. So I don't have a lot of I don't have a lot of resources to build with, you know. So I gotta be wise with what little wood I do have. So I'm I'm the king of, of cheap resources. Amen. Everybody say cheap resources. Cheap resources. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 don't do that. There's some good resources out there. But I'm gonna share with you two uh, of my resources that I use. Because remember we just talked about translations. And so uh, I'm gonna show you. Can anybody see the screen? No. Not oh, there's no screen. Well, we have to plug in and everything. <laughs> so, um, you can write this website down. And I said it yesterday, but I'm going to say it again. It's www.biblehub.com. Say it again. www.biblehub.com. You say, well, there's what is BibleHub.com? Well, what that scripture is going to do, you if you have the internet access on your phone or you have it on your, your iPad or you have it on your laptop or your computer or whatever you can access the internet with, what you're going to find uh, with BibleHub is that it's going to give you the scripture that you put in. So let's say I go to... Um, I think it's coming on. So we're actually going to do an exercise since it's coming on. Uh, 
Uh, no, it's not that big. Let me make it a little bigger. Is that a little bigger? Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm going to go to. I'm at this scripture. I'm going to. I'm going to type in. Holy. I can't. There, there goes my spelling again. I'm going to type in Holy Spirit. All right. So. I'm going to go to Acts 9 and 2, 19 and 2. So I'm pulling up that scripture right there. Now, watch this. As you can see on the screen, now it's a little small. For those who have it on their phone or their iPads or whatever, that BibleHub.com, uh, Acts 19 and 2 says it's going to give you so many different translations to read from and compare from right below each other. So you don't have, you say, well, there's, I don't have the money to go out here and get all these different translations prepared. Listen, I understand you. I'm with you. <laughs> Bible Hub will take care of you. I use it all the time. That's going to give you your scripture with the different translations that you can look at and compare. And you can go from a literal translation word for word all the way over to uh, the, the, the dynamic, then over to uh, the message. All right there for free through the power of the internet. You might say the power of the internet. The power of the internet. <laughs> now, um, I there's one more thing that I want to show you real quick uh, that I use. Uh, once again, I'm all into free. Uh, that's what I like. Um, you see, y'all judging me already. I can feel it. I'm feeling my spirit. <laughs> Holy Ghost is pointing out their people saying, and he's looking at you now. I'm a frugal. And so we're going to go over here, and I'm going to look at, uh, this is a, another free software that I have. And this is called, uh, this from the Olive Tree. Uh, yeah, here's some olives already. I think I know where I'm going with this one. So the Olive Tree, um, you can download it. It's a free app. And what all the tree allows allows you to do is that it allows you to build your library and buy different books at your speed. And now there's a lot of different applications that that you could use. Once again, I won't use what I use because it's easy for me. Uh, the convenience. So I have it on my iPad, I have it on my, my laptop, I have it on my phone, and it syncs up together. So where if you're studying on your laptop one day, you can pick up your phone and pick up the next day on the iPad. And on my olive tree, I'm actually trying to get to the, the resource guy. Oh, here it is. So what it does is you can see here that I bought, like, remember the Haley's Hand Bible Handbook? So I have on my left side, I have a scripture here. And as you build your library piece by piece, it adds it to you. And what it does is it syncs up that scripture with that information. So if I look at Acts chapter 2 and I click on Haley's Handbook, you probably can't see, but there's a little green thing that has like the number 3 in it, a green dot with the 3 in it. You click on that and it's going to give you some notes that Haley's Handbook found about this. And if you notice, it's going to say uh, the theme of the books of, of Acts is best summarized in um, when the resurrected Jesus and the apostles said you will be witnesses in Jerusalem. And you can go click on it, and it opens up, and it gives you all this information right there. Once again, you don't have to do that. This is just showing you what I do, you know, on how I study, you know, how I prepare myself, you know, to go because I take it seriously, sit in front of anybody, to stand in front of anybody to share the word of God. So it is my responsibility to learn as much as possible and to yield my members over to God. So that he can speak through me clearly. And as your vocabulary grows, as your base knowledge grows, God can say more through you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So at this time, I want to thank you for um, listening to um, lesson two on content. I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Chris um, as she will close us out in uh, our information for today. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it gives me cold because I need microphone.
Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. I enjoy that. It's always good to sit back and listen to someone else who's just as knowledgeable. And he studies uh, very hard, and it tells and it shows by his uh, speech. But definitely, we encourage everyone to find something that you can study with a little more. And as we were saying, be prayerful in all of your studies. Always seek God, because like he said, there's so many other commentaries out there and so many other Bibles that will say what they want to say and not actually the word of the Lord. So I was encouraged, and we asked you to go home and read over, reread the materials that he gave you and the one from Lesson 1. And next week, we're going to have a lot of fun with thinking contextually. It'll be hands-on, and I think it's exciting because that's one of the parts that I love. Amen. And we all have software. There's some free ones, and we'll have anyone. We'll have handouts, hopefully, at the end to give you these same sites that we cited. So if you didn't catch them, right now we're going to have them for you at the end of the class. But definitely we want you to be encouraged, and we're so grateful for you, and we each are praying for you that God opened up your enlightenment this year like never before, according to his word. So with that being said,